Augustus Invictus, hello, sir, and welcome to the kill stream. Hey, how's it going, man? Pretty been a long time. How you been? It's been a while. Yes, it has been. I've been pretty good. You know, I have a pretty crazy life. Uh, but uh, yeah. I'm here. I'm living in Mexico now. Uh, so in the Yucatan Hi. Peninsula, the safe part uh, here, very safe part of Mexico. Uh, so yeah, I've had a colorful path since we last talked. Uh, yeah, it's cool, man. Yeah, I heard you got into some uh, some sobriety and some health stuff too. I mean, that's awesome yeah. news, bro. And thank you, man. I appreciate that. Yes. Uh, rededicated myself to sobriety, lost a hundred pounds. Uh, so, Amazing. and thank you, man. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Now for those who don't know who you are, I do this with every guest. Um, give us a little bit of your background and introduce yourself to the Killstream audience. Reintroduce yourself. Yeah. I've had a, a crazy background myself, I suppose. Um, I mean, the long and short of it is I'm the, I'm the lawyer, you know, um, try to live a pretty boring life but uh since the last time i saw you i've i've spent three stints in jail uh, for various uh reasons uh most recently the charlottesville uh thing so i just uh, i practice law mostly criminal law here in uh, orlando florida i got a i got a bunch of kids and uh you know i, I just go to church and train martial arts stuff and that's really all i do so um, now we're fighting the cases in Charlottesville uh, as a defendant, as opposed to a lawyer this time. Now, let me ask you, before we get into the Charlottesville stuff, which is uh, the, the meat of the conversation here, but um, how has it affected your your practice of law, uh, you know, going through all this stuff? Um, how's your career gone on that? Are you still able to, to do all that, or is it, is it kind of sidetracked up? No, I mean, uh, when I got arrested, yeah, it was very sidetracked. Um, <laughs> they arrested me. They held me without bond. Uh, as, you know, the third time they've done that. Um, held me without bail. They uh, extradited me to Virginia. All told, I spent a month in jail for no bloody reason. So throughout that whole time, uh, you know, I'm on the phone uh, with lawyers, on the phone uh, with with everybody. Uh, trying to keep my law firm from going into a total tailspin. So essentially I was running a law firm from a jail cell for a month. So that, that was uh, quite the Herculean feat, uh, but we pulled it off. Um, everybody's case was saved miraculously. Um, when I got out, went straight back, hit the ground running. Um, but ever since then, you know, yeah, it's a pain to have to drive up to Virginia and back, you know, once a month, twice a month, sometimes three times a month, like it's, it'll take a toll on you, which as they say, the punishment or the process is the punishment. But, um, you know, if anything, it's, it's helped my law practice in that now I've got street cred. Uh, no sure. one, uh, yeah, no one calls me a fed these days, you know, back, <laughs> back when we talked, you know, everybody's, well, this guy's a fed, that guy's a fed. Well, this guy's a grifter. That's a grifter. And, yeah, nobody would be retarded enough to accuse me of that now. So I, you know, in some ways, it's been uh, a benefit to be under the under the knife here. You know what? I didn't think about that, but I've heard that from other lawyers who've had to go through whatever you know legally, and it's like, well, it actually gives them a little bit of credibility um, with their clients, yeah. and just in general, it's like, okay, I've been through it too, right? I'm not just talking shit here. It's not just from from an observation standpoint, it's like, Hey, I've been through the ringer and you said it yourself, the process is the punishment. And I've been through some legal stuff myself and that's the best way I've ever heard it put. Uh, the process is the punishment, no matter what happens at the end, uh, it's having that sort of Damocles hanging over your head and you don't know how it's going to go and you have to deal with it every day. And you're thinking about it, you know, even when you don't want to, it pops into your head. That's the real punishment, the mental punishment. Uh, and then of course, if you have to go to jail, like you said, you had to do that month and stuff, that's even more of a, punishment but honestly it's the mental um the mental aspect that takes its toll uh, now we talked about charlottesville how did you get involved what was your role there in charlottesville uh i mean well kind of showing some cards here uh for the trial but uh i, I was there as a journalist i was there for the revolutionary conservative <clears throat> at that time i was actually in retirement status as a lawyer i wasn't practicing law when charlottesville happened so well unite the right happened um at that time i all i was doing was the revolutionary conservative 
uh, which is why I filmed the entire thing. So that's why I was there. Uh, however, I was also there uh, as a speaker the following day at the actual Unite the Right rally. Um, we just, you know, we're at a meeting when the Torchlight rally was suggested. And uh, so we all showed up to that. Now, uh, talk about, well, okay, before we talk about that, what, well, no, I guess, talk about the Torchlight rally itself. Now, of course, um, I, I, I guess that's what they charged you over. Um, first off, when did they charge you with that? Well, apparently they charged me last March, but nobody knew that except uh, Molly Conger, the Antifa journalist. Oh, I know. I, so, I've heard yeah, that. everybody knows. Uh, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so they got these this secret, you know, grand jury indictment. Didn't tell anybody except Molly Conger. Molly Conger knew everybody who was going to be arrested. She wrote about it in her article describing everybody. One of the things she used uh, was, uh, you know, these people ran for office or these people, you know, did this or that. And like she was describing, she knew intimately who these people were who were about to get arrested. And so I was like, well, I ran for office. Uh, that might be me. So I had my lawyer here in Florida call down to see, is there a warrant for me? Uh, and there was not. And so I immediately went to my podcast and, and just trashed the entire spectacle in Charlottesville. It didn't think of it at all after that. Um, didn't cross my mind until, you know, that must have been April, May, June, three months later, three and a half months almost. Out of the blue, they they showed up uh, at my office um, knocking on the door, and it's the cops. Well, would you look at that? And now somebody's walking through my door as I speak. <laughs> so, not the cops. Thank God. <laughs> I was say, so, yeah, we've seen somebody get <laughs> swatted a lot when I hope yeah, not. Yeah, that, that would be uh, swatted on air. <laughs> that would be a new level. Um, so yeah, they showed up and arrested me and they said, uh, you've got a warrant. I'm like, for what? And, uh, they wouldn't tell me, of course, the, uh, the kids were here and, um, you know, they wanted me to come outside. I'm like, dude, I'm not, I'm not going anywhere. They're like, don't resist, you know, the whole stop resisting, stop resisting. I'm like, look, man, I'm not resisting, but I got little kids here. Like, I'm not, I'm not going anywhere. So, um, you know, I gotta say, we gotta call their mother. We gotta say goodbye to them. Like, you cannot just leave little kids in the house. Like, that's not how this is going to happen. Um, I mean, you're at a law firm, for God's sake. Uh, so they wouldn't tell me what it was. They finally, you know, we called the mother. We we got the kids situated. We're walking out to the car, and they're like, so uh, you were at a riot in, uh, I guess, Virginia? I'm like, no, man, I was not at any riot. What, the, what are you talking about? So that's, that's the first I found out that there was a warrant for me. So a couple months later. That's insane. Uh, and, of course, they, you know, you're a lawyer. They could have just contacted you. I'm sure you would have came and turned yourself in, and sure. they could have easily organized it like that. It's too embarrass somebody. It's too uh, mess up their life. Yes, exactly. That's why they yeah. did that. Uh, I mean, I was there in Virginia four days earlier. That's the crazy thing. <laughs> I, I, I was right there, could have just driven up there, turned myself in, gotten right back out. Instead, they made me wait in jail for a month for a bond hearing, extradited me, you know, like you said, the sword of Damocles, like you got this 50,000 volt uh, taser attached to your arm. If you go more than 20 feet away from the officer transporting you, like, you know, you're done for. Um, yeah, that, that whole thing, man, is just so unnecessary. Uh, judge would not give me bond. You know, judge here um, knows full well who I am and just, you know, total liberal judge didn't want to let me turn myself in. Um, and they, the prosecutors in Charlottesville, and my lawyers asked them, well, why don't you just let him turn this out, himself in? And they're like, no, nah, we're not going to do that. They wanted to just go through the whole spectacle. And so you had to be extradited to Virginia. What was that process like? Well, it was the third time I've been extradited. So it, it was, unfortunately, I'm, I'm a veteran at it. Um, Basically, you just wait around for several weeks uh, here in Florida. I don't know about other states, but here in Florida, you, they've got 30 days to come get you or you walk. So they always wait till the, That's the right. dead end of that deadline. and uh, Just to so make you waited. spend more time in jail, right? Uh, yeah. Well, allegedly it's because, well, we're short staffed and, sure. you know, it's a long trip and we got to make arrangements. Uh, yeah. But obviously it's it's part of the punishment. Um, so you wait around. They come get you. Uh, for me, uh, you know, thank God, uh, I guess, you know, part of being well known is that uh, you get arrested a lot. The, the other part of being well known, though, is that you get your own uh, transportation. So like they 
they've taken me twice. I've been extradited. They, they took me in their own car. So I got like, I mean, I was triple chained the whole time, but at least I, I was in a car, not in like some, you know, prison van. Um, and the third time they, they flew me. Well, that is better. Uh, prison yeah. van uh, or even a cop car in the back seat is like all plastic or whatever, right? Like at least you yeah. got to ride. And, and, and well, it's because people urinate on themselves. <laughs> yes, the that's seats. right. <laughs> it's so they can hose it down. At the back exactly. Seat. They urinate, and vomit, and all kinds of stuff. Right. Um, yeah, that's why it's like that. So they can just grab the hose. Um, now, before we go into like the tiki torch thing itself, what did they charge you with exactly? That's an amazing charge of felony called burning an object with the intent to intimidate. So there used to be, well, I mean, there still is, but the history of that is there, there was a law in the books in Virginia. You can't burn crosses. Yes. Right? That's what it's KKK, for. That's what this right. For. Yeah. Specifically to shut down the KKK. They appealed it. Virginia said, no, you can't do that. But then the U S Supreme court said, yes, you can under these circumstances or whatever. But in the meantime, Virginia went ahead and passed a new law. You can't burn an object with the intent to intimidate. So obviously it was to criminalize something like burning a cross in someone's yard. When this originally happened back in August of 2017, you know, the Antifa were just, just the mob was just clamoring that somebody prosecute these people. So the prosecutor at the time, Robert Tracy, said, no, I, we can't do that. These guys are exercising their free speech. They haven't actually committed any crime. This burning an object statute does not apply to this conduct. If you want to, if you want it to include, you know, burning torches on a campus or something, then change the law. Uh, but right now, as written, the statute does not apply. So they did try to change the law. Um, back in 2019, they went to the legislature. They tried to include that. And the legislature said, no, we're not doing that. Uh, we're not amending this law to include that. So after Tracy, the next prosecutor refused to prosecute it. And finally, the Antifa just said, let's just take over the office. So they ran for the Commonwealth Attorney Office. Former public defenders took over the prosecutor's office in Charlottesville with the specific intention of prosecuting this case because no one else was insane enough to say that this statute applied to what happened on August 11, 2017. Well, just again, I'm not a lawyer, but I've been involved uh, in the legal system, uh, so I know a little bit. But just, I, I'm not familiar with this law in particular. But burning an object, obviously, it's about cross burning, like you said, uh, in somebody's yard or something like that to intimidate. But it's it's a tiki torch. You're not really burning the object in the first place, right? Um, because there's a wick that comes out of the end of it, and it has the you know tiki torch fuel or whatever inside of it, and you light it up. It's it's burning. It's like a candle burning, though, right? Not even because a candle burns down. The tiki torch doesn't actually burn down. There's just a flame coming out of it. Yeah, it's, it's pretty it's, clear that like from the plain <laughs> language and the intent of the statue, like we're talking about setting something on fire, right? You're not talking about like holding a lighter and yes. trying to intimidate. Yes, it would be you're like not, if I sit here and held this candle. lighter. Yes, exactly. You're trying to intimidate me now. You <laughs> a felony in Virginia. Um, obviously, that's what the statute means. But these prosecutors are activists, and they are connected with the University of Virginia and the law school there, and they are trying to use this statute to apply to conduct that is clearly not covered by the statute, and everybody outside of Charlottesville knows that. And it's a it's it's a felony charge too. I don't know if people miss that. That's uh, what is the what is the max uh, sentence or you know minimum sentence? Like what is what does it carry as far as penalties go? Uh, max is five years prison. <laughs> five yep. years in prison. Five years prison. Yeah, that's that, where we're at in America, buddy. That's insane to me, especially. I mean, surely I, I don't know, bro. It's insane to everyone who does not live in Charlottesville. Uh, this just like that's their their little bubble of unreality. Everybody in the real world knows this is insane. This has nothing to do with the conduct that night. Five years for holding a tiki torch is just Kafka esque quality. Well, also to me, I mean, it's just flat out. It doesn't even apply. Like I said, because you're not actually burning an object. Like that's not what was going on. But, uh, you know, it's the most liberal part of Virginia, or one of them, I guess, besides the, um, you know, upstate area around D.C. Yeah. Um, so they know what they're doing. 
Um, they've already demonized everybody involved with this for years uh, in that area. The jury pool there, obviously, you know, it's tougher uh, than it would be in another part of the state of Virginia. And to me, this is something where even if they convicted you, surely you could get this overturned on appeal. But that's... Uh, that's short. That's not very much comfort, I guess. Right. Uh, because yeah, well, especially you, not if you got to spend two years in yes. prison waiting for that appeal. Right. That's what know? I'm saying. You, you might be in jail for a long time before you were able to get it overturned. Um, and to me, I, I would feel like it would have to be at some point because it's just complete bullshit. Yeah. Uh, I, it, if, if anyone's actually convicted on it at all, like even with the tainted jury pool, the corrupt right. system there, the corrupt prosecutors, even so, like it, it is unfathomable to me that anyone would actually be convicted at trial on this. But like you're saying, even if they were, it's obviously going to be overturned on appeal. Um, the question is, like, how much time are you going to do in the meantime? And it's funny. I think that the last time we talked, it was actually during the pendency of the, the Rise Above Movement cases. Yes. And, um, I, you know, I, I told people at that time, like, if you want to do activism, this is what you've got to basically mentally prepare yourself for, because you could be spending time in prison waiting for it to go on appeal. If you want your case to go up to the United States Supreme Court, I mean, that could take five years of your life that you're waiting for. I mean, and now that that has not aged too well <laughs> because now Rob Rundo is still in the system for that same case seven years later. And they just won't let that go. The judge nope. tried to throw out the charge and they went to a higher court to get it reinstated. Like, they just won't let it go. I read somewhere that they've spent like $10 million or $12 million or something like that trying to keep this guy in jail. And a couple I hadn't of heard that, but that's not surprising. I mean, there's been like an international manhunt for the guy. He was released. Yes. I mean, the case was dismissed. He was released, went to Europe, and then they're now they're trying to accuse him of being a flight risk. It's like, well, why would he stay in America if he's been released? On, on a false charge. And now he's been released again and they try to, uh, you know, have an arrangement between defense counsel and the prosecution to turn himself in. And they just immediately stabbed the defense counsel in the back, went and arrested him off the street anyway, and then got this order from the ninth circuit saying yes. he can't be released at all. No ability to go before a judge until we say something about it. Uh, it the whole thing is just, it's a constitutional crisis, quite frankly. And if people don't know, the Ninth Circuit is notoriously left wing, uh, and probably like the worst, <laughs> the worst uh, appeal circuit that you could be facing uh, for something like that. Um, but the the judge that was in charge of the case threw out the charges and ordered him released, and then they they still just wouldn't let it go um, yep. because it's not even about. And at the end of the day, he may get it cleared up, like I was talking about with you. But it's not really about that. It's about fucking up somebody's life as much as they can for as long as they can. And maybe they hit it at the end. Maybe they don't. But you just went through, you know, five, ten years of struggle. And it's it's to fuck up that life, but it's also to discourage other people. 100%. Right? It's not just it's that. an example. You yes. know, don't do that or this is what's going to happen to you. Like, for like Nixon, for instance, like they didn't just stop with impeaching Nixon and having him leave office. Like after that, nobody really knows, but they never stopped. Like they had him disbarred from the Supreme Court. He was run out of the legal profession. I mean, they they did not stop till the man died. And, and that was Nixon. And you've seen what they've done with Trump, like running him out of office isn't enough. Like they have to destroy you, put you in prison for the rest of your life. Now, like, that's that's the third world stuff we're dealing with in America now. So. Someone like Rob Rundo, like, you know, not to not to black pill people, but it's it's like it will never end. They, they will come after you until you've left. And even in some the case of someone like me, like I was out of politics for years after what happened to me in South Carolina. I was completely exiled from politics, had nothing to do with it. And then they came and got me anyway. So even if you walk away from politics, they'll still come after you. It really is blackpilling, uh, honestly. Uh, and when you talk about Nixon, you talk about Trump. And look, Trump's not perfect on everything. I know we got some critics of him in chat. I'm critical of him uh, myself on certain issues. Sure. But uh, if they'll do that to Trump, <laughs> like right, uh, one of the most powerful men in the world. Yeah, uh, and it, arguably, and it's not even about him being, you know, down the line. I agree with him on every issue or a chat. He's representing them on every issue. It's about what he unleashed, right? A guy from outside the system came in 
flipping tables over. They don't like that. Uh, and they want to discourage anybody else uh, with his profile, although there aren't many, uh, from doing that. Uh, and they don't like populism. They don't like it, right? Uh, and it scares them. Uh, and it's the same for the activists as well. Um, and it's to yeah. and for the lawyers. You know? Yes, yes. Because I'm not the only one. That, like I'm, I'm the only one maybe that had to do with sh the Charlottesville situation. But, I mean, look at Trump's lawyers. Like, no matter how you feel about Trump, like they're not going after you know Hunter Biden's lawyers for defending him. But if you dared to defend Trump or his allies in court or like John Eastman out in California, you dared to even write a memorandum about a legal issue to President Trump. Like they will try to disbar you for that. They'll try to put you in prison for defending the man or for even giving him a legal opinion. That you can't countenance that in a first world society. You can't have a legal system based on something like that. Well, a lot of lawyers, and I've read plenty of articles about it. Now, of course, it's from the mainstream media, full of shit. But like, um, he's having problems finding attorneys and this and that. And I'm like, well, That's I wonder why, why. they put him in yeah. jail. Like, they don't want you, right. You keep putting those attorneys in jail. You keep having them. They try to have him disbarred every time charges. they defend him, man. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's one of the bedrock principles of the republic uh, is, the, is the right to representation uh, in right. the court, right? Like, Famously, uh, John Adams represented redcoats who had yes. massacred Americans, allegedly, and he defended them. And everybody, he was a revolutionary. He, he was against the redcoats. And he still said, you know, these men have the right to a defense. And no one called him a traitor for it. I, I, there were certainly people who were cross with him about it, uh, sure. but you know, he's famous for having done that on principle. And it's celebrated. It's like, right. wow, look at this. What an amazing, you know, act of courage and, you know, just dedication to his principles. Uh, and anyway, uh, now let me ask you this. So they hit you with the case last year. Now we're still early in, in 2024, but that was six years Mm -hmm. After, like, I mean, I guess everybody's already well aware through our conversation so forward uh, so far that, I mean, it's, you know, kangaroo type situation, a kangaroo court. They took it over to charge you, et cetera. But yeah. six, seven years after, like, wh why didn't they, why didn't they charge him immediately? I guess you've already said why, because they couldn't get the prosecutors to do it. Uh, well, that's part of the reason. Yeah. The, the first two prosecutors just wouldn't do it because the statute does not apply to that conduct. But then you also got to think even after that, like these guys took over the prosecutor's office. What took them years after that to press charges? And, and bring well, I got an idea. Uh, there's an election. The election. There's this thing yeah. going up in November. Yeah. 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 There's this thing coming up in November. And, uh, you know, I, if, if I was just a cynical evil bastard, uh, trying to drum up some, you know, hatred about Charlottesville or, or whatever, that would be a way to do it. Maybe, uh, to get that back into the press, right. Put some more charges on people. Now, did they charge, have they charged anybody else over this? Yeah, I, th I must've been like the sixth person, fifth or sixth, I think. At this point, there have been 11. Uh, most recently, Thomas Rousseau from Patriot Front was arrested. Got him in Texas. Uh, so there's just, they're just going to keep coming. They're going to keep coming for everybody who's there. Um, allegedly, this is about those people who encircled the statue at the end of the march. But, you know, after they legitimize that farce, like, they're going to go after everybody. It's, it's a slippery slope. You allow this nonsensical statute to apply to whatever they think it should apply to. Um, what's to stop them from charging the other hundreds of people there for holding the torch, for intimidating everybody in town, you know? Well, and that's what I was going to say. There was a lot of people there. Uh, yeah, and exactly. I was not there, but I know some people who were there uh, and have talked to them on air and off, uh, right? And uh, But you said something that I wanted to get more on now what is, what about the statue right like I, I don't understand why encircling the statue so what what are they saying i guess what are, what is the uh, what so makes that a they were activity? antifa at the statue right so there were organizers of this march um they had mapped out the route to get where we were going through the campus uh, i was not part of those conversations I don't think anyone's even alleged that I've been part of those conversations, but somebody mapped out that route going to the statue. The Antifa found out about that route 
they found out that everybody was going to that statue, the Thomas Jefferson statue, and they went there. Um, and there are certain people who bragged about the intel that they got. They bragged about beating us there to the statue. They went to the statue, they circled around it, and they locked arms. And when all of us came down to the statue, which is the termination point of the march, uh, they refused to leave. And now, you know, years later, uh, they're accusing us of encircling them and intimidating them and refusing to allow them to leave. It's madness. Well, just by what you said, they were the ones seeking out confrontation. You exactly. guys were on a peaceful protest. 100%. We even called the cops so that that wouldn't happen. Right. Well, um, the Charlottesville cops, we know how they do. Well, <laughs> but still. I mean, to their credit, they had nothing to do with yeah. these false charges. No, they that's true. also said, look, they didn't do anything wrong. I mean, yeah, there were people who got in a, a scuffle. Um, it's never been alleged I had anything to do with that. Um, those people were charged years ago. Obviously, the Antifa weren't charged, but the right wing people were charged who were involved in that. Um, <clears throat> but there's an old maxim, a legal maxim that says, volenti non fit ignoria, which is Latin for the, the willing suffer no injury. It used to be specifically for mutual combat. So if you get in a fight in a parking lot, you can't call the cops and say, hey, I got beat up. It's like, you no, know, you willingly entered into that contest. You, you don't get to cry to the cops now. Right. Obviously, we've we've kind of abandoned that in America because the state has the monopoly on force. That's the, the lie we tell ourselves. But when it comes to something like this, like you deliberately put yourself into a right wing march, you deliberately put yourself at the termination point of the march. And now you're going to cry victim because the people you were trying to interrupt and have conflict with were around you. That's insane. Also, this is a public place. Uh, this this college campus, right? Um, That's right? It's not like you went to somebody's house uh, and encircled their house and was like, oh, you better be scared, right? I got, we got these tiki torches and do what we want you to do or whatever. Like, that's not what was happening. You were on a pre-planned march right. to, a, to a final destination, termination point, like you said. They found out about it. They went there. If they hadn't went there, like, it wouldn't, there would have never been any confrontation in the first place. And there's proof of that because this happened back in May of that year. Just several months earlier, the same thing happened. Torchlit uh, rally. Yes, was I was like just talking about mob. it before you got here. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And Antifa didn't know about it. And as if by magic, there was no confrontation, no violence, no intimidation of anybody. Um, and if the Antifa hadn't inserted themselves into the march on August 11th, it would never have happened. So... Like you're saying, it's not in somebody's house, which is the intent of the statue. Right. Like, you know, you can't go to people's houses and burn crosses in the yard. Like, I can get on board with that. I understand <laughs> I that one. I don't think most people these days would would argue that that's a free speech situation. Like, I should be able to go to burn crosses <laughs> in anybody's yard. Like, nobody's going to seriously argue that. I can that, understand but, that one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, you know, where they kind of started crossing the line is they're saying, well, you also can't burn crosses on public property and you can't burn crosses in an effort, even on your own property to intimidate other people who can see it from miles away. Or that's where they started stretching it and stretching it and stretching it. And now we're to the point where you can't hold a tiki torch without it offending somebody. And you're looking at five years in prison. That's well, the slippery that's, slope that we've gone down. And you just illustrated perfectly. First off, I don't think you should be able to burn crosses on somebody else's yard to intimidate them. But as far as I'm concerned, if you want to burn a cross on your own private property, uh, you should feel free to do that. Right? I, I, don't, I, don't I agree, you, actually. Uh, I mean, if you uh, want to read Karl Marx on your own property. Right, yeah, yeah do whatever you want on your own property. I mean, as long as it, you know, you know, it's not hurting anybody. Um, I, I don't see how you could, you know, for whatever reason, burn a cross on your own private property. Um, but you illustrated perfectly how they stretch it, right? And I just have to keep repeating this. The tiki torch is not actually a burning object, right? Like, um, it's not like the the whole torch is on fire and it burns down to the to the end, right? Or, or like it's some stick you're holding, like in the you know, like cavemen would have, uh, or back in the ancient times they would wrap uh, whatever, like fuel or 
Yeah, right. Bar- flammable. Kerosene. Yeah, kerosene yeah. around yeah. the end of a club and carry it around. It's not like that. It's a wick that I've had a tiki torch in my yard. I mean, I'm sure some people listening to this have. It has a wick that comes out the end of it. Even the wick doesn't burn away, right? It just. I mean, after the symbol that they've made of Charlottesville, like it, if you burn a tiki torch in your yard now, is that not the same thing? Intimidating people, like. We seriously have a law now in Florida where they're trying to prosecute people for waving Nazi flags because the swastika is implicitly a violent threat against people. That's how far we've come. Like just the the mere symbol itself, just the mere sight of a tiki torch or a swastika is now a threat of violence to people. And look, I wouldn't be waving one around, but I'm not I'm not for that either. Uh, that law either. Uh, when I was growing up, it's like, uh, you know, people can come out and wave their Nazi flags if they want. Right. Um, that's their political belief. Now, there wasn't much support for that. Right. Uh, and it would get you some heat uh, if you did some stuff like that. But that's just how I was right. That was like the national understanding. Right. The ACLU used to defend right. the Klan marching through towns. Right. right. Like this was just understood that this was a civil civil liberties thing. Uh, you might hate these people. You may disagree with them. You can come out and yell at them if you want, right? And say, uh, you Nazi, stop it, or whatever. Um, but to, to criminalize political speech, which is what they're doing, um, is, a, is a dangerous road to go down. Uh, and they've already gone down it quite a ways. Well, ironically, you know, the ACLU thing stopped with Charlottesville. Yes. And it was really a watershed moment in legal history, political history, and a lot of ways. And one of those was the ACLU because they won the case for Jason Kessler. They won the case. They, the city of Charlottesville tried to remove the Unite the Right rally from Lee Park because the whole point was about the Robert E. Lee statute. That's why everybody was there. Um the, the ACLU won that in federal court, got the rally put back in Lee Park. You know, the local Antifa were furious about it. Um, but also the ACLU staff was furious about it. And it's my understanding that a quarter of the staff threatened to resign if the ACLU ever did that again. And so, you know, you've seen it uh, ever since Charlottesville. ACLU's never stepped in for a free speech issue again. Not for white people anyway. Not for, yeah, I was going to say, not for white people, not for people on the right. Uh, and right. When, when I was growing up, it was totally different. And it literally changed with Charlottesville. And I'm glad you pointed that out. Uh, because the ACLU, sure, they would defend some, you know, wild and kooky shit too. But they were also there for everybody, really, right? Like, hey, you can't right. criminalize this. Look, yeah, we're going to defend the Klan. Uh, you know, they should be able to march. Which they should be able to march. Like, what the fuck? Um, but... That's not the new paradigm, uh, and you see polls, and now this is getting into a little bit different conversation, but you see polls. Uh, people, um, and it's not just on the left, it's a little bit on the right too, but especially on the left, where there's not as much respect for the First Amendment. And the First Amendment is not just about freedom of speech, it's freedom of assembly too. Uh, and there's not as much respect for uh, political speech and free speech as well. And you see poll after poll where that just keeps trending away, right? Yes, we should criminalize certain speech. Yes, there is hate speech and it shouldn't be allowed. Well, I, I was, when I grew up, that was just anathema. And I was a leftist when I, you know, when I was younger, right? Like <laughs> right. that was just like, right. the accepted position on the left. Like, yeah, I mean, the ACLU is famous for backing up people for burning American flags. Yes. You know, especially during the, the start of the war on terror, which is when when I came of age, um, you know, burning an American flag was was considered treasonous by the right wing. And the ACLU is like, nah, you can you can. That's obviously free speech. Uh, and now to see them go completely the opposite way and be like, nah, we're, we're not concerned with free speech anymore. We're concerned with racial equity. We're concerned with trans rights. You know, free speech is a thing of the past. Man, I could, I could go on about this forever, but it's just a complete paradigm shift. Uh, and you used to see people in the media too, like, you know, your talking head types, your Bill Maher types and all this. And they would always be like, yep, you know what? The, of course people can march. Of course they can do this. We can't shut it down, right? But now... It's it's shut it down. It's fuck up people's lives. Right. Um, and even if you come out the other side, uh, the process is the punishment. Uh, like we started this conversation off with, and it's it, people don't understand unless they're been in, unless they've been entangled in 
<laughs> in a legal process, just how draining that is. And it costs so much money. And, you know, they try to make you a pariah. And I, there's just so much cost uh, to this. And it's really about uh, trying to, to stop other people from speaking their mind. Now, what advice would you give to to others what might you would you do it again first thing i guess i might ask um would you do it again and then what advice would you give to others who who wanted to do some some activism on behalf of their political beliefs that might be controversial yeah well i'm sure this video will be used at my sentencing uh but yes i, I absolutely would do it again now looking at the video of my own conduct that night like yeah i, I was maybe a little carried away with with being flippant about things and and I, I was kind of juvenile making fun of the Antifa. Um, I certainly wasn't intimidating anybody or saying anything, you know, threatening. Like I was making fun of them. But, you know, I guess I'm, I'm older and grayer now. So looking back at my, my youthful exuberance, like it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of embarrassing. But would I do the march again? Absolutely. 100%. It was, it was a beautiful event. Um, my advice to every, and that's that's you know with everything that's happened with you know getting arrested in front of my kids and and spending a month in jail and and having to go through the legal process I, yeah yeah I would, i'd still do it again because to me it's worth it and I, i'm honestly honestly like uh, honored to be in in this kind of fight um i have been arrested a couple times on something absolutely dishonorable i had no glory in it whatsoever just just ground through the system for absolutely no reason that there was no you know win to be had at all even in winning outright as i did there's there's no real win because it was just destroying my family like something like that i'm not happy about that but something like this this is a, a political fight and it's something that will make the history books so I, i'm actually glad i'm one of the people that was arrested i i think that um i have the ability to fight and um, i'm glad to be in it so you know, my advice for people you know, is not necessarily, yeah, go to these events or, or, you know, hold another torchlight rally. I'm not saying you shouldn't either, though. I, I am not one of the guys that's saying, well, all events are for feds or, you know, all events are honey traps and, and you're all just getting set up. Like, I, I'm not, I'm not going to take that cynical view. I, I'm not blackpilled at all. And I think, you know, I'm also glad to be arrested for this and facing trial because in the years leading up to that, you know, when I was just the lawyer on the right wing, I would tell people, like I said earlier, you know, you got to prepare that you're going to spend five years of your life going through this system and, and making it up to the Supreme Court. Like it, it takes a long time. You got to be willing to be in it. You, you can't just take a plea at the beginning because then you, know, you won't get to go all the way to the end and make the constitutional arguments. If you really want to be an activism, you got to prepare for the fact that you're going to go through the legal process. And so being able to do that myself, I'm actually kind of happy about it. Um, so my advice for other people would be to answer your question in a long roundabout way. No, I <laughs> like, love that answer. Don't, uh, don't get black -filled. and do keep fighting. Even if you're not going to rallies and you just want to, you know, do online fundraising is a big thing. I, I don't care who is going to point fingers at grifters. Like it, you have to raise money for legal defense funds. And you have to raise money for people's commissary. You know, all these activists are getting arrested. They're going to jail. Like, who's paying for their commissary but their families? Like, we, we all talk about being part of a political movement. And yet, when our guys go to jail, everybody's scared to talk to them. They won't send letters to them because they don't want to get found out. You know, they, they don't want to put money on their books because their names are going to be on the books. You know, but meanwhile, they're struggling to buy honey buns. They're, they've lost their apartment. Their kids' custody is in jeopardy. Like, people, these guys need help. You know, that that's why people get black because the consequences of the arrest and grinding through the system, like, nobody wants that, especially not when everybody's terrified to help them, which, which is the point. It's the, that's the point of what this system does to people. So my advice would be keep fighting, don't get black pilled, and help each other out. Amazing answer, and and you hit on it there. To commissary is very necessary, uh, as an old yeah. Eric that that uh, that I heard, and um, that's part of it, right? Um, you know, not forgetting about people when they go up uh, on some bullshit, and um, 
I was going to ask you earlier, and I feel like we've hit most everything. This has been one of my favorite interviews I've done this Ooh. year for sure. Um, and I, and I, you know, I want to be re- respectful too, and you know, try to be thoughtful with my questions because I know they're going to play this probably, like you said. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah. have they? What I was going to ask this earlier, and I forgot. Have they offered you any kind of plea deal um, on this? No, they haven't. Really? I, I think I think they're smart enough to know I wouldn't take any plea <laughs> yeah. deal. Up. Dude, in South Carolina, they were trying to put me in prison for sixty-five years. Jeez. They came and offered me probation at a certain point, and by the time it got to trial, they were offering me time served, expungement. This never happened, and I was like, "No, I'm not taking anything. We're going to trial," and uh, I won. So. Like if I, if I'm looking at 30 years prison, 65 years prison, I'm not taking an offer. Like these guys know nice. it's a waste of time with me. Like I'm, I'm going to destroy these people. I will crucify them on television. So it's high stakes now all the way. Very brave, sir. I would, I would say that there's probably about 0.1% of people who would not take a deal if they were facing 65 years. Uh, I said that, okay. You just went even further up in my books right there. Uh, because, uh, because I took a deal facing two or three extra, right. And did eight months instead. Uh, so I, well, yeah, and I don't blame anybody for that, man. I mean, no, 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 no. Yeah. Of course in Charlottesville, bro. Like there was a dude from Texas He's got 10 kids, man, and they're they're freaking, you know, denying him bond. He's got 10 kids, can't go home to Texas. So, yeah, he took a deal. I, I don't blame that no, guy. No, yeah, it doesn't mean that they're less than, but I mean. No, not at all. Because almost. Probably uh, better family men than me, maybe. That's, maybe that's what it means. <laughs> More responsible. Maybe that's what it is. But, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, I wasn't throwing shade. I mean, I'm one of the ones that taking a deal. Not It was on some something not political. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm just saying that's. It, it takes courage to to do that too, and and again, everybody has to make their own personal decision. Like you said, you got kids, 100%. or you you have to, you know, you just want to get out of this, right? And you can feel 100%. like you can accept what they're offering. You know, I completely understand. You have the whole weight of the state against you. Um, that's a tough spot to be in. Uh, so yeah, definitely not throwing shade on anybody who's taking any deals. But I was just curious uh, if they'd offered you one. I'm also curious how can people support you uh, if they want, uh, and how could they they find you and and stay in contact and keep up with your case. Uh, well, I don't, I don't presently have any grift operations going. So. Oh man, you know, I was thinking yeah, you, you know. did. I was like, <laughs> I was like, I was ready for you to to talk about your legal fund or something. But no, nah, I mean, yeah, the biggest grift I got going now is you know just hire me to do your your legal case. <laughs> so I'm on uh, Twitter at Emperor Invictus. That's probably the easiest way to find me. Um, my, you know, my address is public. My my email address is public. So anybody wants to to talk with me, consult with me. Just reach out. Like you can find that, or you can hit me up on Twitter. Very cool. And I just linked your Twitter in the chat. All right, uh, killer. And I appreciate you coming on. Like I said, um, I, I, I think this is so good. We could stretch it out a little bit further, but I think we really nailed it, uh, covering everything in about these forty or forty-five minutes uh, that you've been cool. here. Uh, and I'm gonna clip it up uh, and put it out on its own because this is a really long stream, so more people will see it uh, and put it up on the podcast feed and all that stuff too. Uh, and I just want to thank you. Uh, for taking time to talk to me tonight. Uh, I hope everything turns out for the for the win for you. Uh, maybe we can talk again about it too uh, as things proceed. Uh, I would like that as well. And just, you know, thank you for standing up uh, against this, honestly, because um, it's a tough spot to be in. Uh, and so I'll just thank you on my behalf, on the audience's behalf, uh, and wishing you and your family the best. Sure, man. Awesome. Thank you very much, bro. And yeah, again, I'm uh, I'm happy for you, man. Proud of you. Good Thank to see you. The, the changes, man. That's that's very positive. I love it. Thank you, man. That's very kind of you to say. That was very kind of you to start the interview off with too. That that yeah, of course, man. Cool. I think it should be it should be praised. You know, that's awesome. I love seeing uh, big life changes, man. That's awesome. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it, and I appreciate your time tonight. Augustus Invictus live on the Kill Stream. You have a good one, sir. You too, man. Thank you very much. All right. Good night. Wow. Okay. This disfigured corpse sent twenty dollars on Rumble. I'd hire him. <laughs> I might hire him. <laughs> Thanks for watching this clip. This is Willow. Remember to like and subscribe.